If you look back over the, the history of painting, everybody has, you know, these background preoccupations about what should painting be like, what should painting as a whole be like. But when you come down to it, you're in your studio and you've got a bare canvas, you're faced with what should this particular painting be like. And the steps that take one from this definition of painting to this definition of painting are made in very small increments, all of which are played out on the surface of the painting. And it was in that, that was the level that I wanted to try and bypass. I wanted to deal directly with the question of what should painting be like. I, th I think now if I had to describe what I'm doing in a single sentence, it would be the drive towards um, program autonomy. I want the program to be responsible for as much as possible, less and less reliant upon decisions that I make. It works very well. You know, I can leave the machine on while I go to bed at night and I've got 150 images to look at the next morning. The selecting is a difficult problem because, you know, when I wake up in the morning, the 60 images all look fine. It's not that, you know, you do 60 and maybe two of them are okay. They're all okay. Again, the, this whole set would have been produced in one night. I'll give you some notion of even when the program is obviously working in the same domain. The forms all start from um, imagined plant forms. You, you can still see things um, resembling leaves and tree structures yeah, and so yeah. on. Um, there's, what the program has is, this, is a, a description of how things grow. So every time it, it does a leaf, it's actually, as it were, growing that leaf according to what it knows about how things how the leaf grows in the first place so even though you get families of um, leaves or flowers uh, you never get two examples that are exactly the same the program knows that there are different kinds of leaves in the sense that it knows that different kinds of leaves actually grow in different kinds of way computers are good at that kind of thing Mostly what I'm thinking about is colour, actually, but um, to the degree that that comes up, I'm trying to position myself on that um, cusp where you're not quite sure from one moment to the next whether you're looking at um, a representation or not. Um, you know, if you, if, you look at, if you look at Cezanne, you'll find there are two paintings going on at the same time. One is overtly representational and is probably a landscape or might, might be a landscape. But when you look closely, you'll find that there's a second landscape in the brushwork that is, you know, has... that works in a different kind of way. Yeah. It, it's a, There's stuff going on. And it's, it's that kind of duality that I, I think is interesting, where it... Yes, of course they're leaves, you can see it's leaves, but when you then you forget it's leaves and you're looking at uh, something else. That's the, kind, that's the kind of quality I was looking for in the colour. You know, where you, where you get the colour vibration, but you, you, don't, you don't really follow the drawing in there. The one key realisation that probably dates back to the early 60s, <clears throat> Was, was the feeling that one couldn't go on inventing right through one's life, that one had to find some way of bypassing the, the process of invention. Uh, at that point, the paintings I was doing were very much invented. I mean, I would, you know, have to come up with shapes that yeah, were painted you. as if they were things in the real world, but weren't yeah. really. Yeah. And I, I was becoming more and more... Um, aware of the fact that this required me to go on making up stuff. And I got the feeling one can't, can't go on doing that. And I, I finished the 60s with the growing feeling that the paintings were very beautiful, and everybody said they were. 
but that they could have been painted by anybody. I, it didn't seem to me that they really reflected my own central concerns. I, I wanted to invent a way, I, I thought of it as having the paintings paint themselves. There was almost a consensus that this was a very strong painting, this was not as strong a painting, this was a good painting. And he thought, but everybody has a different theory as to why this is a strong painting, why this is not so strong. And what if you could cast those theories into executable computer code and test them? And the test would be what came out at the other end. Would it be a strong painting? Well, then it was a good theory. Would it be a not so strong painting? Then it wasn't such a good theory. This is how it all began. So when I was offered the opportunity to learn programming, I, I said yes the same way that I would have said yes to any number of other things. Everything looked more interesting than what was happening inside my studio at that point. But it didn't take long to realize that this offered the opportunity to come to terms with some of the things that had troubled me and had remained unresolved from the 60s. So in a very real sense, the, the use of the computer simply followed on from this desire to deal with the, the business of making art, not with the, the individual art object. I, I, wanted, I wanted to concentrate on how art gets made. Creativity isn't something magic. It's knowing one hell of a lot about your field, plus searching very deeply in a space of possibilities that is extremely large. And Harold has been really a pioneer. He's the only artist who's really approached this task. They're, I mean, other artists do it, but they don't think deeply about what they're doing. In fact, they don't even believe you can think deeply about what they're doing. Somehow it's mystical, invisible, it's so-called tacit knowledge. I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just doing great things. He reminds me of uh, the stories of Michelangelo climbing up on the mountain and chipping the marble out of the cliff himself. And he really does everything. When it came time to uh, build a painting robot, Harold actually mastered all the details of how, uh, of all the electrical circuit details and all the integrated circuit details of how you construct an electromechanical, electromechanical device that would uh, do the painting. A complex adaptive system, we find them everywhere. We find them in nature, we find them in uh, man-made systems such as the economy. Uh, and Harold, all by himself, quite independent of any scientists, had created a complex adaptive system which makes art. So these are his first drawings of Aaron. And then I think it moved to more complex. You can see the difference in quality. I think what's interesting about Aaron, one of it is that it's evolving all the time. Because the program seemed to be learning, which means also Harold is learning about how to express or represent or uh, make the computer draw these things. The first version of the program couldn't do much more than distinguish between closed forms and open forms. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the program was built so that um, it was giving a reasonably close representation of freehand drawing as opposed to simply geometric drawing. How do you represent in the computer what a person sees, a visual object, when the computer itself has no feedback? That is, when we watch things, we see things, or when you're drawing, you see and you get a feedback as to what you're drawing, and then you go back and change it or change your direction. But think of a blind uh, artist. Basically, that's what he was trying to do. To me, it required a person to be very scientific or mathematically oriented, and also to have artistic training and sensibilities. And most people don't have that. I don't know of anybody else besides Harold who can do both. Now it begins to have sense of what a plant looks like, vegetation, and has these people. 
and these faces are very similar to style in these things, so you could tell that it was also an evolution. And this is the first style, but colored by Harold. This is what we were talking about when uh, we were asking, how do you decide what goes next to each other? And how do you know they go well together? But I think it's beautiful. On the wall of our uh, apartment is a magnificent example of Aaron's work in this area. When I looked at it in detail, I said, Harold, this is amazing. How could it possibly have thought of these color arrangements? They wouldn't occur to anybody. He said, yeah, they wouldn't even occur to me. And, and I think he said, this may be the world's best colorist. It's an extremely sophisticated printing device that needs expert manipulation, uh, expert setting up to get what you want. Um, but once I'd done that, the kind of color I was getting, you know, I knew I would not, I couldn't do that with paint. That printing technology, I think, really represents the first major revolution in color since Impressionism. The question is, how can these drawings be so interesting? Isn't it a, isn't it a robot doing that? How could it be interesting? Well, this, let me tell you a little story about, not art, but about chess playing. The artificial intelligence people take it as a great triumph that in 1997, a computer program named uh, Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov, the world's chess champion and often thought to be the, the best chess player who ever lived. Kasparov was deeply shaken by that event. But he did give an interview in which he talked about how he was spooked by one totally unexpected and brilliant move that the computer program made. And he said, I was looking into the mind of God. Now, what does he mean by that? A computer program was doing it. So what could he possibly mean about being so awed that it was like he was looking into the mind of God? What he means is that the complexity of the space of possible answers of possible solutions was so enormous that the program finding one that was of that level of quality and brilliance was amazing to him. He, he wouldn't have expected that that was a, a human experience to be able to find that. Well, the same is true of Harold's program, Aaron. It has an absolutely enormous search space. For some of the searching it has knowledge, rules of art making behavior. For others, it uses random choices. And occasionally it comes up with path combinations which are absolutely stunning. A uh, artist friend of mine uh, said to me once that um, if one person out of all the people who looked at her art, if her art touched that person, they, then she thought she had succeeded that as an artist that somehow she had communicated or touched somebody. And to me, this uh, painting talks to me. That is, I really like it. And so in some sense, if you use that criteria, Aaron as an artist is a success. Is that art? Is that science? Who cares? You know, I've lived with a bunch of Cohen's for a while, and I find them endlessly interesting more you cannot ask of art. What Harold has done is to lay out, in a way no artist has ever been able to lay out before, an incredible self-portrait. Not in the artifacts themselves, which are beautiful, because they are what computer scientists would call a proof of concept, but in the program called Aaron. It's a cognitive portrait of his decisions as an artist. It is dynamic, it changes over time. What he thought 20 years ago is not what he thinks now. And you see that in the code. And so for me, that is one of the things that makes Harold's work unique. And I don't use that word lightly. 
uh, it is unique because no artist, to my knowledge, and I've certainly not heard of any competition, has laid out his cognitive processes in such explicit detail as Aaron lays out Harold Cohen's cognitive processes.